Rebecca Rower is a cartoonist and educator whose captivating work of graphic memoir, Bird in a Cage, won the Doug Wright Award in 2017. Here we discuss that book's subtle engagement with the significance of home as a source of comfort and as a place that eventually exists in the hazy space of our memory, populated by figures from our family that leave a deep impression on who we are as people. I ask her about the aims of her current project, 100-Year-Old Wisdom, and its interest in making us more open to the lived realities of aging and the aged. But to begin with, we talk about her forthcoming graphic biography of civil rights activist Viola Desmond, which will be out in October as part of the Nova Graphica anthology from Conundrum Press. Rebecca gives us a sense of how she approached the consequential task of representing Desmond's story, how she felt the responsibility to do extensive research into the rejection of racial inequality that caused Desmond to be criminalized, and into her heroic efforts to carve out a space of autonomy in defiance of white supremacy as a black entrepreneur. Ultimately, it's a story about what Viola Desmond's legacy means right now, as pervasive anti-black racism persists in Canada. So I guess I wanted to start with the the comic that you put together representing the, the legacy of Viola Desmond and a long ongoing history of anti-Black racism in Canada and maybe more particularly in Nova Scotia. The comic mm-hmm. is called Vi- Viola Desmond Had a Dream Too, and it'll be in an upcoming conundrum anthology, uh, Nova Graphica. How did you get involved with this project, I'm wondering? And you know, did you create this graphic nonfiction narrative before or after that project was conceived? I got involved because a friend of mine, Laura Kennans, who's another Canadian cartoonist, um, we met each other in Halifax many, many years ago. And um, she had this idea to um, put together uh, an, an anthology about Nova Scotia history and brought it to Conundrum and, and Andy uh, Brown, who's the publisher there, agreed to do it, and they um, sought funding from the from the province of Nova Scotia to publish the book. And she was the one to ask me to um, contribute to it. And I was really excited about it because I had already been working on a story about um, Anna Swan, who was um, this giantess who. Uh, was born in Tatamagush, Nova Scotia. Um, and I, I had already written like a 78 page uh, kind of graphic novel thumbnails um, for a graphic novel about Anna Swan. And I was like, oh, I already have a story kind of lined up. I'd love to do something with that and, and contribute it to this comic. But as I was going through that work, I didn't feel like I could condense it in a way that felt uh, appropriate to the way that I wanted to tell Anna's story because I really wanted it to be more from her perspective. And it's hard with less pages to set the the um, perspective. It takes more time or more space to kind of establish a character and the feeling inside of the character. And anyways, I just didn't feel like I wanted to compromise the story in that way. And I thought about other stories um, that I wanted to tell. And I looked into different women's stories, uh, particularly. And Viola Desmond came up for me because she had just recently been um, the put on the, as the face of the new $10 bill. And actually, it's her 104th birthday today, or it would have been. And um, I just thought her story was so important to tell in like, not only as a Nova Scotia history, but it, as you say, a greater story to tell for, about the history of, of anti-Black racism in Canada. So I researched her and there's, yeah, I found um, amazing information, not only about the uh, moment of her discrimination in the in the movie theater, but also about her as a person and her um efforts to create this empire of um, black beauty culture in Canada based on um, uh, Madame C.J. Walker's enterprise in the States. I, yeah, I just fell in love with her story and read her, her sister's, the book her sister wrote about 
um, uh, her her life and her her own life, Wanda Robson, um, who was the one who kind of championed um, for Viola to be get the pardon and the apology from from uh, the Canadian government that she deserved, and so that's how I ended up doing the project. You're actually packing so much into a short space. In this comic, Viola Had a Dream too, and it, it demonstrates so much research. I wanted to talk about that too. I mean, the comic as a whole has a documentary-like quality, uh, both in its non-linear framing and because it does include so much factual information, you know, like the statement by Justice Hall regarding the racism inherent in the incident, which mm-hmm. is quite mo- you know moving in terms of the fact that um, you know it's you're vividly rendering this significant historical turning point in race relations within the Canadian justice system. And then you're also providing so much context around the event of Desmond transgressing against racist segregation laws by, you know, sitting in an off limits area of a Halifax movie theater. And I guess it's this juggling of um, historical research information with the kind of texture of experience itself that I'm interested in. You know, you note the fact in the comic that, Viola had unexpected free time due to her car breaking down. The fact that she simply sat close to the screen because she forgot her glasses, a simple fact that exposes the absurdity of creating racial distances in everyday life. All of these details provide so much texture and specificity to the story. What research went into kind of bringing it to life, to creating the space that is uh, relegated to a time in the past and maybe commemorated with a $10 bill. But when you structure it in a comic, it, it's more it's more complex. I mean, did you have to rewrite it a number of times or did it come together fairly um, fluidly? It's so nice to hear that that, that comes through how much research um, I did came through because really it did take a very long time to make this comic. I did a lot of research for it and also it went through a lot of restructuring, definitely. I think what was really important to me was presenting Viola as a human being and 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 bringing to light the impacts that um, racism has on the dreams of of people so like how racism can destroy people's lives and destroy people's dreams and how that's still happening today using Viola as um, her story as an example and especially as one that we kind of herald as like uh, you know, we have the ten dollar bill. We're all past racism now. We've made the apology. We've promised to do better. But then, actually, looking at this, the state of of um, anti black racism in Nova Scotia and even in, in the greater in greater Canada and the world, we see that this is still ha- playing out. And so, I wanted to research not only Viola and her backstory um, because I think. We she was in the news a lot when the when the ten dollar bill came out and a lot of I read a lot of articles that kind of briefly skim over um, you know who she was but I don't think a lot of them really talk about her enterprise uh, um, her um, the amount of work she did and this that to create this um, black beauty culture enterprise. And her ambition, like she had incredible ambition. And she also had a, came from a family that was a really interesting family that did their own kind of quiet activism. Her mother, who was not Black, often would write to the newspaper and, um, you know, if she saw something that was not fair in the education system or something, she would speak up about it. And her, as they say in the comic, her... Um, her grandfather was one of the was the first black postal worker in Halifax. They had a history of of um, kind of standing up uh, against racism, and she came from that legacy. And also, she, in her work, um, created this amazing um, uh, way, this amazing structure to raise women up and 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 black women who were not um allowed to be really viewed as beautiful women as like icons of beauty she gave them an opportunity by creating products and and beautifying them to like have that kind of uh 
self-respect and self-love. And just in so many ways, she's such an inspiration. And these articles didn't really touch on that. They talk about her like standing up for herself in this moment. Um, but really, she was she was doing this kind of transgressive stuff in many ways in her life. And so I researched about her and her life. Um, a really lovely thing happened where I was I was in France at uh, this artist residency in Angoulême for cartoonists and animators at the time of starting to to write this and to research it. And I was trying to get my hands on this book by Wanda Robson um, and Ronald Kaplan, who was her co-writer, who was a publisher at a uh, this small press in Cape Breton, but I couldn't get my hands on this book and it would have been very expensive to ship it from Canada. And I ended up just calling the publisher and and Ronald is the publisher. And I called him in Cape Breton and we had a great conversation and he knows Wanda. Of course, they wrote the book together and it felt like I was back in Nova Scotia and just like walked down the road and was talking to a neighbor or something. He was like so friendly and generous with me. And he offered to send me a PDF of the book, no charge, as long as I, you know, sent him a copy of the the comic when I was done. And he was just like, so happy that Viola's story was being told and honored. So that was a really beautiful moment in the research. But I also wanted to research and know more about the current state of, of anti-Black racism in Nova Scotia. And um, I was looking into the street check report, this uh, Wortley street check report, which had just come out. So actually a lot of things were kind of very timely, like the $10 bill had just come out. And also this uh, Wortley report had come out in 2019, a few months before I started researching. And it was like such fresh data that was just showing so um, blatantly how the, the there was this discrimination still going on uh, with street checks in uh, in Nova Scotia. And all of these recommendations of what should be done about it. And so I read through the whole uh, report, which is quite long, and also showed it to other people who live in Nova Scotia now. I used to live in Nova Scotia, but I don't anymore. So I felt a bit out of touch and discovered um, all these issues having to do with the land deeds uh, that a lot of African Nova Scotian families who are from Black loyalist backgrounds, didn't um, receive deeds to the land that they were given in exchange for their uh, uh, fighting for the British. So, and even to this day, as I say in the comic, even to this day, they uh, haven't been given the deeds so they can't bequeath their land or, you know, they don't have the rights to the land that they should have, even though they've been paying property taxes all this time. So, and it's very confusing because, Now that, you know, hundreds of years have passed, family members are disputing over their land and it's really confusing to know who owns it. And it's sort of like a mess that is almost impossible to solve. So there's still resonating so many issues for uh, Black Nova Scotians to this day because of uh, anti-Black racism, sort of like from the beginning. And I'm just using Viola's story as a lens to look, uh, you know, into this greater issue. So it did take a lot of, a lot of research and then to kind of like uh, braid it together in a coherent way. And it, and to my mind, it works really well. And, and I, I hear you really emphasizing this um, central theme of Viola's generosity toward her community um, as a kind of transgressive act. Um, and I think, you know, part of the goal of this, this comic and it is it is brief, but it does so much. Is to connect that to the contemporary moment. You talk about fresh data. We're we're faced with the reality of the movement for Black Lives really spontaneously uh, expanding across the globe, and conversations around around reparations and defunding police becoming commonplace. You know, it's it's stories like this that you know do emphasize the kind of need for a degree of generosity with regard to community. We are too. Um, we are two white people talking about these stories at a moment where a kind of multiracial, multi-ethnic solidarity is incredibly necessary to, in a way, like save democracy from this kind of tendency toward nationalism, white supremacy in the form of Trumpism and so on. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think, you know, my, my next question, though, is about what's particularly useful about the comic medium. 
it, it seems to me that you're, you're playing with some of the uh, kind of generic aspects of documentary, but it's very much still a comic and you are, you know, an author of comics. I wonder, or you're a cartoonist. I wonder how you think comics, perhaps in excess of what even documentaries are capable of, can do to provide critical context on these key moments in the struggle for social justice. Well, I mean, it's just like my meet comfortable medium or something. It's just like, in per- like as a personal preference of just enjoying drawing and also what I like about comics as opposed to documentary and I think documentary is great and it, it can be can be done in, in um, amazing ways but there's something about it that it presents photographs and and live footage and it, it sort of seems very factual or something and all stories have many uh, sides or can be presented in a certain way and I like the fact that with comics you're the hand of the author is is so present in the draw in the fact that it's drawn by a hand and you see like it's obvious that I'm that my bias is there because it it's my hand drawing it um and with documentary the hand of the of the documentarian can be more invisible I don't know there's something I I um I think you kind of also get submerged into the world um, through the drawings you just enter into sort of uh, the imaginary space of the story being told and I don't know I guess I don't want to like I don't want to put down documentaries at all I think that there's definitely a place for that but there's there's something really wonderful about comics and also um, tying together bringing so much emotion in the drawings of, of facial expressions and and the way that the story could be told uh, with text and images together, I just think it's it's effective for showing the bias in things and also amping up or or sort of addressing the humanity of of uh, stories. And it's yeah, just sort of the the medium that I feel capable to tell a story in. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's clear that you've thought a lot about it, um, and that you're clearly very connected to it. Um, I, I, I've always felt like it is a really distinct medium. That's why I ask. And it, I, I think you've captured nicely what it is about it that is so distinct. It's, it is the hand of the author, all of these individual decisions being kind of represented indelibly, um, you know, and I think Dan Close talks about how that kind of static interplay of, um, you know, text and image uniquely allows readers to kind of slow down their, um, their intake of visual information. And that's very, really vital today where we are so bombarded by visual information. I mean, even acts of police brutality um, become kind of overwhelming on some level. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I think about the act of police brutality done to um, Santina Rao uh, in Halifax here, um, who you represent in, in the comic, right? Mm-hmm. A woman who is still working to get justice in the face of the indignity done to her in a local Walmart here where she was suspected of shoplifting and harassed violently in front of her children. I mean, these videos are, I think, you know, at best shocking in some ways. And then at worst, uh, they play into a kind of sick fascination. Like they maybe yeah. go viral for some of the wrong reasons. Um, you include the actual instance of police brutality done to Viola Desmond and your graphic engagement with her legacy. Um, You show us, you know, Desmond sitting in jail for 12 hours, no one informing her her of her rights. Um, These scenes do make Desmond a deeply human, sympathetic figure. Um, You know, I guess, you know, my my question is really about how, um, you know, uh, how you've made the choice with your own hand to kind of um, represent the small details like, you know, Viola losing a shoe as she's dragged away and how you thought about rendering something like um, Santina's, uh, the abuse Santina suffered um, in, in a graphic context. Um, was that difficult to kind of render? Did you have a certain kind of, you know, I, I talked to Box Brown on this podcast about the representation of violence. And he basically said, you know, he doesn't, want to represent like graphic violence, but there is still something 
sort of safe and figural about representing representing it in a graphic context. Did you feel that same sense that there was something ethical about um, depicting these moments of uh, racist policing? Yeah, that's a great question. I it was so painful to I had to like watch um, that video that footage of um, Santina like um, being uh, abused by police kind of over and over in order to like catch it at the right moment to get the like visual image I wanted to use and yeah it, it, it's um it's really awful imagery to take in I think it's I think it's probably more I guess you get the impact of it with a drawing but it's kind of uh, maybe less violent if it's if it's drawn or something it's like um, removed a bit from the experience I hadn't, I hadn't, I guess, really um, thought about sort of trying to censor the violence or something. It, I, it, I drew this before. Uh, I mean, obviously, police brutality has been happening and and been hap- and been caught on camera much before all of this. The more recent uh, Black Lives Matter uprisings, but I've been finding myself just seeing so much right now in the media that I like. I'm hitting. I can't, I, I can't do it anymore. Like I kind of, I feel like I've hit a, a, a limit of like how much I can take and which, I mean, I, I recognize I'm as a white person, I, 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 it's a privilege to be able to look away and to, to kind of uh, not have to face it uh, myself. But I guess when I was drawing the Viola Desmond scene uh, with her, the violence that was happening, I was trying to, um, weave together more um, pieces of her humanity within the violent uh, assault with the police and emphasizing the fact that this isn't just a body, a black body being dragged out of a theater. This is a woman with dignity and ambition and um, an incredible uh, work ethic and, and dedication to her community like alongside of the violence or woven together with the violence, because I think that creates a deeper impact to understand that, you know, this isn't just, um, you know, an act of violence. This is a terribly immoral act. And um, yeah, I I wonder, I hope I, I didn't do Santina a disservice by showing her moment of violence. I think my intention is, was to kind of show that she is a, a woman with humanity and a family and a, and everything as, as just as much as Viola was. I think that definitely comes across. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, that's um, okay. Yeah, like, I, I think, you know, hearing you talk, it's clear that um, there, there's a degree to which you are appropriately kind of conflicted about making these representational choices appropriately in the sense that, like, it ought to be complex to render these histories. But it's, it's clear that, you know, um, it's part of the responsibility of being an effective ally to kind of dwell with that conflict. I mean, um, you know, in your rendering of the history of Black people in Nova Scotia, you choose to, to narrate it from the perspective of a contemporary young Black woman. Uh, she is, in a way, the nameless protagonist of your text. So, you know, despite not being a person of color yourself, you clearly felt it was important to represent the story in this way, to not you know, fall into that kind of white savior complex. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I, in part, I wanted to know why you felt it was important to represent the story with this kind of framing to show African Nova Scotians as experts in the history of their own struggle for justice, dignity, equality. This t- comic, like your book, Bird in a Cage, denies the reader narrative closure. There's an audience ex- expectation of closure. Um, you, but instead, you reaffirm the fact that the struggle is not over that this anti-Black racism persists. You know, how and why did you conclude the comic with this open-ended empowering of Black Nova Scotians to speak the truth that racism is far from defeated? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, um, to your first question, I sort of a comment about the narrator. I kind of put my, yeah, I thought it was important to kind of um, have the story be told from this young Black woman uh, and I kind of put myself in the position of her white, her tall white friend. I'm like a tall uh, woman. <laughs> I look kind of like, I don't look like the girl I drew in the comic, but I kind of thought of myself as um, 
put myself in that character and sort of imagined this if we were like two girls um, kind of studying together and getting some snacks or something at this convenience store and like um, my friend telling me what what's up because I didn't have to ever know about it because I'm white and I it didn't it doesn't affect me in, in my community I'm aware of of not wanting to take the position of a white savior I recognize yeah I may not be the best person to tell this story but in any case the story must be told and um, I just I want to do my due diligence to try to do it in the most respectful and, and careful way possible and um, for that reason I um, made sure to consult and uh, or, and ask the publisher to hire a um, an African Nova Scotian sensitivity reader and work with him who act- and this is uh, Michael Davies Cole who was our uh, my sensitivity reader on the piece and he actually is um, a relative of Viola's husband and and uh, so knows Viola's history so well which is which is really was amazing to work with him and I just wanted to, you know, be care- be very, very careful with how I told the story. And also in terms of the ending, I really struggled with knowing how to end it. I, I you know, I'd like to be able to have like a, in, like a call to action, like, a, and here's what we need to do to end racism in order to like use the energy of the comic to guide uh, the reader to some kind of way to make a difference or, or something like that. But I don't know. There's there they, there's you know lots of ways to resolution, and also we just we first have to face it and to sit with it and recognize it. And I don't really have the answers. I think at the time we there wasn't so much, or maybe I wasn't aware of discussions around defunding the police. But that feels like it's been a more recent call and and demand. I just didn't feel like I could kind of end it in like a. And here's how we're going to solve the problem, just to kind of end it with a way, uh, with a just sitting with the um, the issues and allow people to just grapple with that. And I've been kind of like, you know, I've had a few, particularly like my dad, <laughs> who didn't like the ending because he was like, oh, this is kind of a downer. But it's like, yeah, it is a downer. We can't just like make it all feel better with a nice kind of uplifting message at the end because that's not the reality exactly i I think to end with these um instances again of the kind of everyday reality of racism in the education system and the justice system you know you're you're forcing the reader to dwell with these with these persistent realities of structural racism and to do anything else would have been kind of irresponsible in a way Mm -hmm. Um, rather than a call to action what do you hope readers will get out of reading the comic and and I guess more broadly how do you generally imagine your audience like who is it compo- composed of is it a small circle of people the general public uh, other cartoonists um I feel like uh, like originally when I started doing or just thinking that I wanted to do um I wanted to do children's books to begin with and I so I kind of like thought that children would be my audience but adult like like adult issues are just so I mean that's in that's my world and and um I feel like it takes uh even more experience and um I think every sort of a lot of people think that they can write for for kids and they think it's very simple but I think that's actually a lot harder and I I don't know I think I um because I had stories to tell that were had more adult issues, it sort of um, ends up being for adults in a way, or maybe young adults. Like this story, for the Viola story, I feel like the audience for it is young adults and adults. because, Well, mostly because it has kind of adult themes in it, but also I think I want to speak to a younger generation as well who um, may not be aware of the history or aware of what's going on, or maybe they really are and they're that they would be glad to see it represented in the world uh, more in in the media and, and um, so I think I have a I, I'm not that actually great at sort of targeting one audience with my work. I, I think I maybe for adults it feels a little bit childish and 
and for kids, it's kind of dealing with adult themes. So I'm kind of, I think, kind of straddling a line there because I think like I, my voice, I think is kind of a bit kind of naive or I kind of come, I like to come to things with a sort of sense of wonder and playfulness and sort of um, just discovering something and, and, and being really open to it. I think that sort of is like a childlike uh, angle, but I think that, that that's something that adults need in there also and respond to as well. And that, I think that sense of wonder comes through even in your style, um, the style that you have, which um, a friend of mine noted is not so kind of mathematically precise in a way, right? Like you're not even using the kind of thick black grid that, you know, comics conventionally have. Uh, there's a greater kind of fluidity um, to your work. You know, I had a question about sort of um, comics as a whole and, and public perceptions around them. You know, Andy Brown in a conversation with Noah Van Skyver kind of addresses some of these issues around like even like locally in Nova Scotia having to explain what comics are to people, like what yeah. he does. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing to explain your work to people. But I think, um, you know, the, the your last kind of response addresses some of that stuff in the sense that you're talking about how you have to sort of straddle uh, multiple demographics. Comics can break through uh, to multiple demographics and people maybe that don't read uh, too much literature, maybe find it more accessible and so on. Um, do, you, do you agree that there's something something kind of um, surreptitious about the way that comics can, can infuse complexity into a conversation uh, or make, make these complex ideas more accessible? Absolutely. Um... You know, I, I was, I did like, I didn't read a lot of comics growing up other than Archie comics. I had like a million Archie comics, um, mm-hmm. but I was never really that into sort of, uh, you know, the superhero stuff or anything. But when I read, um, you know, Mouse and Blankets and um, some Linda Berry stuff and like, and I'm really remembering uh, uh, this this graphic novel that came out, um, I think with House of a Nancy or Groundwood, it's about sort of um, indigenous um, gangsters and sort of sort of the, the warrior class and in indigenous society and how they were supposed to be the protectors of the community, but how sort of through uh, residential school systems and different, uh, you know, obviously uh, abuses of, of indigenous people Thing, things really got off track and how this guy who ended up kind of in gangs and dr- and doing drugs and stuff kind of comes back around to, to rediscovering his um, sense of being more of a warrior for his um, community. Like that story, I don't like, it's so difficult sometimes to, to watch a documentary or something about or read about, um, sort of difficult issues but to but to read it in a a book with pictures you kind of get drawn in by this imagery and it's so accessible and then you you like get sideswiped by the like really intense feeling that can be captured and and the information that can be relayed with with so much emotion and um and and I just feel like it has this incredible power to relay this information but but in a way that really um, touches you and kind of can change how you feel in your perception. And I remember, mm-hmm. and like particular, like I remember like my, my cousin who's a filmmaker made a documentary about um, uh, Resolute Bay and this issue of um, a priest uh, going to different communities and molesting young boys in these, in these remote indigenous communities. And I couldn't really bring myself to watch it. I was like, I knew how heavy it was going to be. And then I read that book, um, and now I I'm, I can't remember the name of it, but something the about outside the circle. the outside circle. Thank you. It's an incredible incredible book, and I read that book, and then I felt ready to watch the documentary. It mm-hmm. like opened up my I don't know my capacity to uh, to like face that issue. I I just think yeah the the accessibility of comics kind of allows us to to address to kind of face uh, those really heavy topics. I think 
Uh, maybe we can uh, use that as a way of segueing into, because I don't want to keep you too, too long, um, your graphic engagement with aging, which is similarly, I think, invested in trying to demystify and even destigmatize aging, mm-hmm. um, you know, making it something that isn't so scary. Um, and I think there's also a degree to which your engagement with aging is also somehow deeply feminist at its core. You know, you you have these, you know, moments where I think you're talking about the body and the body aging and sexuality in ways that are meant to be empowering and destigmatizing and to reveal these power relationships that are deeply, you know, bound up with capitalism. But maybe before that, I had this question about the the motive force of writing anything like and I was thinking about Margaret Atwood uh you know uh, maybe the most kind of emblematic Canadian feminist author in a way um she once said in a National Film Board documentary called Once in August that her her muse the figure that she pictures when she writes poetry as especially is an older woman um and the documentary spends a lot of time trying to uncover what Atwood is haunted by and she keeps resisting it and interrogating the question itself, shrugging off these stereotypical ideas about writers needing to be haunted. Um, and then at the end, the film takes this turn when it arrives at this more positive question of the muse, which Atwood says is an older woman. Who or what is your muse, could you say, when you write comics or create illustrations like this? Do you, you know, in terms of the muse, are you working consciously toward inclusion, destigmatization? these kinds of things? Wow, I'm really curious. I wonder, I immediately think that uh, Margaret Atwood is like writing to her older self or something like, mm. I don't know. I think for, yeah, I think for me, like I'm, um, I, especially in terms of the, in terms of the, the, the comics I'm writing about aging and stuff, it's really like trying to be for everybody because I, I think, yeah, we do have this pervasive issue of um, rejecting aging and being afraid of aging and kind of putting locking away our elderly so we don't have to be faced with it and um, just hating this this idea that our bodies are going to go into decline. It's so sad to watch our our loved ones age and die, but really, like, there's so much um, growth that it can happen in in um, the old, elder years of life and. There's um, so much passion that people still have and so much to give and, and reasons to live. And I think we need to kind of um, kind of turn our thinking around about it. And that's what I'm sort of trying to do with that. I think like, I think, I don't know, with those comics, I kind of am speaking, I think, more to like a, a generation, my generation and, and the slightly older generation, like my parents' generation. I see them struggling with... Um, helping their elderly parents and and I and I think uh they're afraid to age themselves and then you know it all goes down the line like I'm watching my parents go through that and I know they're going to age and then so you know it's it's all kind of uh connected and um so I I I do want my audience to be sort of as wide as possible so I'm it's very it's tricky because you know it's hard to speak to everyone and to the the language that everyone would respond to at the same time um sure. but yeah also like children children I've I've been a school teacher for middle and, and high school kids and I I have I feel like I have this alter ego inside of myself um that's still a little girl who's like open to wonder and play and um who's confident knows what she wants and I like I like also being able to use that voice and to speak um to kids and because they are going to inherit all of this and they're going to know a lot more than we do um but we can also you know pass on what we but what we know down to them so yeah I'm just trying to reach all of humanity basically (laughs) (laughs) with my um, work <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm curious about the um you know the work you've done as an educator and um but i'm aware of time and i'm not sure how much you have so i kind of wanted to maybe talk about your award-winning book bird in a cage because it really struck a chord with me and i, I hope lots of people and and this ongoing project 100 year old wisdom 
where you search for the secrets to a long, healthy life by interviewing centenarians about their perspectives on aging. So can we move to some questions about that project? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So one of your interviewees, Lawrence, uh, swears by vodka and talks about his long relationship to his wife. Uh, Relationships are a consistent theme throughout these comics. It's a lovely short story with one kind of interesting moment of kind of slippage uh, at its center. Um, there's a certain point where he mentions that his wife had a miscarriage, mm. which he descri- he describes as nothing major. And you, you in the story mentally express surprise at his characterization of it as nothing major. And, you know, elsewhere, I mentioned your comics being deeply feminist. You've had, you know, you've had commissioned work on um, acceptance of public breastfeeding and, and these kinds of things. Like there's, there's clearly um, a, a specific interest in women's health. Was this moment in the Lawrence story a subtle point about maybe a generational or gendered misunderstanding about the grief that it causes? Yeah, for sure. And like one of the, like uh, usually when I when I talk to um, people that I'm interviewing, I always ask about, and I think it's kind of uncomfortable sometimes, but I always ask about Uh, reproductive health and like if they learned about contraception or like if when if I'm talking to women I I ask sort of when they remember learning about menstruation and if that was talked about in their families and different things because I think those issues that were really taboo in generally in in cultures you know there are some exceptions to that for sure but depending on the family but it's it's really interesting to me to kind of address that because it was so taboo or it kind of continues to be sometimes and I want to know what they re- how they reflect on it and how they remember that and you know so often and the most of the time people say like my parents didn't say anything about it I was like you know shocked to <laughs> find I was bleeding or whatever or like you know um we kind of knew it was going, what was going to happen because of what other girls were saying, but nobody really talked about it. Like somehow they received this information or they figured it out, but it was, it was not really um, uh, presented to them or, uh, and, and it was always really uncomfortable. So I, 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 yeah, I, it's funny. It's interesting that you picked up on that because I kind of forget about it, but yeah, I am kind of especially looking was sort of especially interested in women's stories because of, you know, the oppression that women uh, have faced uh, throughout uh, history and kind of, and do kind of continue to face in in that um, women's reproductive rights are sort of always up for renegotiation in in politics and all that. And I kind of am part of the, the reason of interviewing people who have lived through the last century is to point out like, these, this stuff that was going on uh, in these people's lives who are still alive is not that far off. It's not that far away from our own experience and our own timeline. This is just mm-hmm. in, in one past, uh, you know, generation. And we could, it puts into perspective sort of how precarious uh, women's rights are and culturally how recent it is that we can actually start talking about these things openly I think like only really recently people have been starting to talk about miscarriages and it's even with great trepidation, like there's still very sensitive topics and I want to normalize those things with my work. And I I originally was, was only going to be interviewing women. That was kind of how I originally, I just, I was thought it would be neat to interview, you know, wise women, older women, but then I, you know, kept coming across hundred year old men who had incredible stories and I couldn't deny hearing from them and and presenting their stories as, as well. But I, I am kind of, and I sort of grappled with how um, to present the stories if I should enter into the story at all. And at first I was kind of, or not with the Lawrence comic, but then later I started kind of using myself as a fake reporter. Like it was, I was being, I was framing it as like, I had a, a news network or the kind of thing, but I, I kind of am abandoning that framing, but I'm still keeping myself in it in a minimal way as a way to reflect on what's being presented to me to kind of, you know, I, like as in with, with what happened in that moment where I'm like, hmm, just a mis- miscarriage, you know, like mm-hmm. 
uh, as a way to kind of reflect on it within the comic instead of just presenting it as like a documentary. Yeah, it again kind of it, it's evidence of the of your hand, your particular kind of bias, as it were, uh, uh, in the comic itself, right? Like you're you're putting your own perspective into the comic just in terms of the representational choices you're making. And you have another example of this in the the comic in the series featuring Jupe and Emma, where you're talking about sexual health. There's this moment where uh, you document their children getting uncomfortable with the questions you're you're asking, and like. Jupe and Emma are unfazed. Yeah. And, and you choose to include this otherwise like kind of maybe marginal moment as exemplary of the need, as you say, for kind of a, a movement toward acceptance that is not over, like with, with regard to reproductive rights and sexual health and so on. So like that moment is not marginal for you. You're making this choice to kind of foreground it, uh, this moment of kind of shame that's experienced by young people in this moment. Um, yeah, yeah. Which I thought was really interesting. Um, I wanted to talk about Bird in a Cage, which is this extremely personal text um, that's concerned with your grandmother and her development of uh, um, this this tendency toward wandering. This is how it kind of begins, uh, due to the fact that she was struck by a, a car and suffered a brain injury that caused early onset dementia. It's a heartrending, beautiful story. A friend of mine who read this comic noted that your style resists being caged by panels in tr- the traditional ways that comics are structured. Uh, Bird in a Cage definitely demonstrates this re- resistance to highly structured graphic narrative, and much of your work doesn't even include the thick black line work that's a hallmark of much graphic storytelling. I guess, you know, my, my question uh, um, is really about, uh, um, you know, how the style in some ways blends with the message of this text, how you're kind of exploring uh, through narrative ways of encouraging empathy for the invisibilized elderly. Uh, uh, What was the process like of actually having to, um, you know, make these kinds of representational choices with regard to your own, your own story? I mean, um, you know, for people that are thinking about writing graphic memoir, how does that work? How do you, how do you make these kinds of choices? Yeah, so for that book, I really wanted, because it's about uh, my grandma's decline into dementia, I really wanted to sort of capture a feeling of um, memory slipping away or like, and also sort of when you remember something and close your eyes and picture the event or something, it it's not like a solid uh, photographic memory. It's sort of like, or for me anyways, it feels more like a wispy outline of something. And I wanted to kind of capture that in the artwork of the story, um, especially because she's losing her memory and it's sort of unraveling. And yeah, panel borders did not feel necessary or in fact felt like that would um, solidify too much the image. And I wanted it more to kind of like blend from one panel to the next with a, with that hazy pencil line um, just to address that that theme of memory and and in, because it was not only my grandmother's memory disappearing but also me recalling my memories of her and the, the the sort of stories that she told and so the the medium was very uh, I was trying to use it to directly address the themes in the book and also, when I started drawing comics, uh, as I said, I wanted to do children's books at first, and then I kind of discovered the world of comics. Some friends gave me um, a bunch of graphic novels, and I was like, oh my god, the, everybody's a genius, and this is like an incredible art form, and and there's so much that can be done with comics. And um, when I started doing them myself, before I went to Center for Cartoon Studies, I was drawing um, these really free-flowing on the page uh, st- stories that like didn't have panel borders and didn't really have like a grid at all. And when I learned about comics, I've learned about the grid and everything. And I, I kind of wanted to like maintain the pre-educated uh, quality of my work. The thing that just came out of me that before really knowing what comics were supposed to be like or something. So I, I never liked doing panel borders. So I, I just didn't do them. I didn't, feel I needed to do them. And I think that as long as it's it's legible that this is a distinct image from the next image, 
I don't think you necessarily need the panel border unless it's, you know, helping change uh, perspective between like past and present or, or some different thing. I kind of like that because you're, you know, your brain is just taking in this image kind of like that it flows between. And so I tend to avoid panel borders in my work. And I love that you connect it to memory because to me, the most, you know, for me personally, the most moving panel, um, you know, in the entire book is the, the moment you depict the entire family singing songs you had sung for 80 years and your grandmother, despite not being able to hear, um, still singing along, like reading lips and singing along. And it's, it's drawn in this similarly kind of like fluid way. Um, that really connects to, uh, in, a, in an almost, you know, physical way, the reality of, of memory. And I guess, you know, the, the question I wanted to ask is about the, the way that the book also thinks about um, the meaning of home, right? There's this extremely profound panel in the book where you talk about your grandma's search for home. Um, and you, you, in, in one small frame, you ask, where is home? She was searching for a place in time that no longer exists. And you convey this like deeply philosophical point about the question of home as both a spatial and temporal location, but do so by blending image and text. It kind of explodes on the page. Were you also trying to convey this in the narrative structure of the book? Like the narrative is circular. It begins at and returns to the cottage, um, talking about how long the cottage has stood. How, how How do you juggle these complex ideas? Uh, in in graphic form, yeah, I guess I was sort of yeah, I I, I was really struck by her like um, even though she was like frail and old, she she still had such purpose to to get home. Like she really like her her body wanted to navigate herself back to this place that she felt comfortable and that felt familiar, um, even though nothing felt familiar anymore. And we share this home, the, this family cottage. And so sort of about like how home can be shared in family and, and um, how her memories growing up at the cottage are just like my memories growing up at the cottage and sort of the cyclical uh, nature of time and passing down of, of memory um, and home to each other. I love the I love the the puzzle of of making a comic of 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 having a story and like the raw information that I want to include or that can that supports the story and how to piece it together in the most impactful way that carries forward the story and calls back to things that we discovered before and I just love the um the challenge of that and, or, or, I mean, it's really, it can be very frustrating, but it's so satisfying to complete it when it's, when I'm able to, when I'm able to do it. So with this book, I I kind of had done the first 20 pages of it when I was um, a student at the Center for Cartoon Studies in my final year, we had to do like a 20 page comic when we first, or a 16 page comic when we first arrived, I ended up doing the 20 pages but um, kind of just as I like blurred out uh, what you have inside you when you come back from summer holidays. And that's the story that I wanted to tell was sort of this, um, it was a bit self-contained about um, my grandma's accident and her decline into dementia. And then sort of the, the power of music that brought her out of her dementia and kind of brought her home. And then um, that year she stopped eating broke broke her hip and stopped eating and I kept, I was flying back to Toronto to be with her as she was dying and then back again for the funeral and sort of the things that were I had written the first part of the book and then all the things that were happening in the second part um took place after that and I still wanted to tell that I wanted to continue telling that story and especially to to reveal um the inner the person within the old the old person you know I think we look at the elderly and you know we just see an old person and we don't really see the whole rich history of the deep sort of inner hopes and dreams and the and all their different life experiences and and their colorful characters and um everything and I wanted to kind of paint 
give more of a picture of who my grandmother really was and her faults and her struggles. And I think it's really important to tell those stories so that we see the humanity in, in, um, in the elderly. And so that was kind of an interesting puzzle because that first story, that's the first part of the book was like already written. And then I had, um, I created another arc with a second, with a second part. To me, the book was this, as you say, kind of exploration a reaching toward um, who this person was and what she meant, like thinking about her perseverance, which is something that also comes up in your comic about Rose, Toronto Island's oldest resident. Um, Perseverance is the primary theme there. You talk so much about the restlessness of your grandmother um, and, and the search for a place that feels like home. Uh, it's It's been really wonderful talking to you. I, I think I'll just maybe pose one more question to you. Um, and, you know, I, I would sort of be remiss if I didn't try and highlight this one comic that really spoke to me, um, Lost in the Sublime. Mm. Uh, you know, this, this, this comic was itself a kind of sublime comic in the sense that it's, a, I think, poetic. It's trying to, you know, it's a kind of visual poem in a sense uh, that's assembling all of these elements in kind of an abstract way. You connect it to wide open spaces, places teeming with life, your own sense of feeling kind of disconnected with the spaces around you at times, having dreams of being tiny in a massive space and vice versa. And I wanted to kind of end with this question because I think people can probably relate to these small moments of kind of almost epiphany. I grew up in a rural environment in Port Dover, Ontario. You talk about growing up in uh, rural Nova Scotia in that comic, and you're really able to capture sublimity in, in that comic, I think. And, you know, my question is, is about uh, the connection to experience and whether you think, I mean, you're, you're now living in Toronto. Do you still think these kinds of experiences of the sublime are available to people in the city or is the sublime an altered state that is unique to natural environments? Just to say that I actually did grow up in Toronto, but I went to school in Nova Scotia and oh, I lived there for eight okay. years. So it's very um, a dear place to me and kind of where my heart okay. remains but but um to the question just to just to clarify that but the question mm-hmm. I feel like it's almost the sublime um it's almost like a state of mind it could be like a, a recognition of our um connection to the universe or something or like our our smallness in the universe and our great our largeness in the universe and um I think there are ways to access it even in the city, but I do think it it helps to be confronted by nature. I go, I go, I spend a lot of time at the waterfront in Toronto. I lived on the Toronto Island for many years and still return back there a lot. And um, I was just uh, over the weekend biked down to the Leslie Street spit where you're like really. Um, at the edge of the city and the lake and you know there are ways even to even to just like look up at the sky like lie down and and look up through the trees and there are ways to find that but it is a lot harder I think it's like so it's so much easier to access that when you're out in nature and find yourself in a forest or or in the middle of a lake or something like that but I think I do think it it sort of could be like a state of mind and and if you kind of reflect and kind of try to visualize your place in the universe like it's kind of astounding um mm-hmm. how small we really are that comic uh also was was something I did while I was in school at Center for Cartoon Studies and was you know in my early education of comics and it's it was it's like these stories where you know, there's like this abstract concept and this like kind of wow moment or a sense of wonder moment that I just want to share with the world that I feel like comics is such a great medium to employ to address those wacky, weird thoughts, certain feelings and, um, and to be able to share that sense of wonder with, with, uh, with my audience and, um, or maybe inspire wonder in other people is what I'm trying to do and and hopefully I'm achieving in my work so 
I think, yeah, comics have, have a really great power to to tell that kind of story, but but and also and kind of um, spark an inner an inner search or or an inner understanding. And and that's what I really appreciate about your work, and the, and the reason why I wanted to talk to you is that they are immersive texts. They're deeply empathetic, um, and they do inspire this sense of wonder. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you making the time to talk to me. Thank you so much, Scott. It was really great to talk to you.